from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Lee Haber. I'm books editor of O, the Oprah Magazine, and I have the great honor of being the moderator of this incredible um, pair of authors um, who are very, very similar writers. <laughs> That's what we were just talking about. Um, Jacqueline Woodson, um, whose new book, <laughs> Another Brooklyn, came out recently to rave reviews. And um, Jay McInerney, whose new book, Bright Precious Days, is also getting stellar coverage. Um, I read an interesting piece in The New Yorker um, that you all might want to look at. Really good piece on Jay and um, his history. Um, so what I want to start talking about is, like, why did the books, National Books Festival pair you guys? <laughs> it's like not, it's not exactly a no-brainer. Well, um, but there is the New York we do We do both write about New York. That's so. right. So I, I'm guessing that was the, that was the, the thread. Um, so Jackie, I'm going to start with you. Um, you write about a New York that's very different from the one Jay writes about mm -hmm. in his trilogy and in this book, <laughs> Another Brooklyn. What does the title Another, Bro Another Brooklyn suggest to you? Um, well, one thing is definitely different from Jay's Manhattan. Um, <laughs> I or think the Brooklyn of today. Of the Brooklyn, yeah, definitely. Or Park Slope. Or Park Slope. Well, Park Slope is its own another Brooklyn. So I'm writing about a Brooklyn that no longer exists, uh, a neighborhood that no longer exists as it existed back in the day. And that's one of the um, threads of the title. The other is, of course, the girls wanting to find a way out of that Brooklyn and the many people trying to find a way out of that Brooklyn. Um, it's also about all the different lives that are being lived. And so, so it has a lot of threads, but really I wanted to put Bushwick on the page in a way that I think can easily be forgotten. I think a lot of times when neighborhoods get quote unquote discovered, um, people forget the history and that it had been a neighborhood where people were thriving. Um, my daughter just started high school at a high school called Beacon in Manhattan and she said, her, she came home and she was so mad because she said her social studies teacher said, you know, I, live in, I lived in Bed-Stuy before it was safe for anybody. And she's like, I'm like, did you respond? <laughs> um, but, but just that idea that a place where people of color or where underserved people live would be considered a place that's not inhabited right. um, because, it, because the people living in it are not seen. But you, and you are romantic about Brooklyn in a way, that the Brooklyn of that day. And that's something uh -huh. I think you share with Jay. Right. Jay is very romantic about Manhattan, the Manhattan of the 80s, the Manhattan of today. So would you agree with that assessment? Well, I, I, still, yeah, my, I still love Manhattan. And, um, um, but I, I think I have a, in the book, the, the characters, um, have a certain nostalgia for the New York of their 20s, which is the, the 80s, basically. And um, I know my wife gives me a very hard time for being nostalgic about a period when, you know, when, when one's apartment was constantly broken into, when there was a heroin epidemic, when there was crack vials popping underfoot like acorns in a forest, and graffiti covered every surface. But, um, but I, you know, it was a, it, it was a, it was a very creative time in New York, and uh, and, and also Manhattan. Uh, Manhattan hadn't been thoroughly gentrified at that point, which I, which I think yeah, it's hard to some, remember which, that. But you're right. Which, yeah, which was in some ways a, 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 a good thing. Well, I asked Jackie about her title, and um, I'm interested in your love for the word bright. <laughs> <laughs> well, I bright like, lights, big city. You know. The, the, the previous, the, the novel that starts the trilogy, and now this one. I know, it's, Falls. It's, become a, it's become a tick on my part, I think. But, um, you know, it's funny, I just, I came up with this uh, title. For me, it was sort of a, I, I don't know, it was kind of a mashup of me and Yeats. And for, for some reason, I actually thought that Yeats had this phrase in his poetry, and uh, it turns out he no. doesn't. But, uh, <laughs> By the, by, by the time I, I realized that, I was kind of fond of the title. And, and the title, um, in, in this case, in the case of this book, really refers to um, basically, you know, 
the days that you don't notice going by and then in retrospect mm -hmm. are really the, the, the most important ones, the, mm -hmm. the ones that make up the bulk of our lives. Um, I don't know, I just, I just think in terms of bright, I, I, you know, I think my characters are attracted to New York like Moths to the Flame and um, I think that's part of, part of I, 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 like, the, I like the word in, in its, in its, in its uh, insofar as it denotes intelligence and, 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 and illumination and um, um, I don't know. I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to try and stay away from it for the next few titles. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing, so as I was, I was talking about, as I, after I was invited to moderate this panel, I started thinking about how dissimilar these two writers are in so many ways and, and their books. And um, so, Jackie, your book is really about youth. Um, it's about, you know, p people, girls, who it's before they have become who they're going to become. Wouldn't you say that? So, uh -huh. so and, and you do write a lot for adolescents, uh, about adolescents. So can you tell us a little bit about why you're drawn to that period in a person's life? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, people tend to say you write in the period you're stuck in. So you write in the age you're stuck in. And I think for me, it's somewhere between 10 and 16. Um, <laughs> so, but, and drawing on that, that's another, Thing that Jay and I echo is the memory, the looking back um, with this kind of melancholy and nostalgia mm -hmm. at a period. And so in the case of um, another Brooklyn, August is looking back on that girlhood with that same kind. She says, you know, I know now what isn't tragic. What's tragic isn't the moment, it's the memory. So looking back on it and realizing that while you're in it, you're not aware exactly of how quickly that time is passing right. and that one day it will be passed. So, um, so I think one thing, that's the case for grown-ups and adolescents, right? We look back and it's like, wait, I'm no, no longer that young person, I'm no, no longer that girl, and so who am I now? Well, I think, and it's funny that you cited that line because right here, I have, what is tragic isn't the moment, <laughs> it's the memory. <laughs> um, and, and then I found something you said somewhere, a writer writes to hold on. And I think you're right, both of your books are, you're, you're still inhabiting youth in some ways or, you know, um, aching for it or aching for a time or, you know, looking back with a kind of world weariness. Mm -hmm. um, Jay, what would you, you're, you're, I think Ayelet Waldman in the New Yorker piece that I cited before was talking about um, malaise, the middle-aged malaise with which your characters are. Well, you know, in, in an otherwise very, you know, good essay and a, and a, and a, and a favorable one. I, I think she emphasized that malaise a little bit too much in that there, there is a, uh, Russell Calloway, the, the, you know, one of the main characters in the book, does, does go through a, a, a depression, basically. Right. Um, um, it's part, I think it's largely situational based on the fact that he's made a really stupid decision uh, in his, business in his decision. publishing business, and which, is which possibly is going to bring his publishing house down. So, I mean, I was a little... Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't think really that this is a book about middle-aged malaise in the sense that most of these characters are pretty um, animated. Uh, right. Well, that's like, a like middle-aged malaise York, is a you know, cliche. It is but, a cliche, but most of these mm. characters are pretty obsessed with, you know, like what's next right. in their life, you know, as parents, as professionals. Uh, so I and also trying to hold on to a, a marriage that is yeah, and in their stable and steady in some ways, though with um, people going mm -hmm. sometimes going in different directions, but people still trying to be engaged with each other in the world. Um, right? But marriage is tough. Um, that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the main subjects well, what, of this and, book. And <laughs> you begin the book with the Richard Hell quote about marriage that's so good. Um, let's see if I can find it somewhere. But any, uh, about mystery and, oh here, every marriage is its own culture and even within it, mystery is the environment. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think you capture that so beautifully um, about yeah. Corinne and yeah, Russell's inter marriage. Interesting quote from the sort of founder of New York punk. But, uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> wow. but that's actually, I mean, but you know, that sort of uh, it captures the, I don't know, two of the poles in this book. I mean, it, you know, it does, it, does look back to the days of the, these characters' youth when, you know, there was punk music was being invented at CBGB's on the Lower East Side, and it, but it's also about 
people who are now turning 50 uh, and dealing with middle-aged problems and crises and, and marital dilemmas. Well, since you mentioned music, there's a lot of music in your book, yeah. mm -hmm. Jackie, and um, you know, in some ways it's kind of an ode to jazz, right? Uh -huh, uh, um, the, uh, uh -huh. Even the way the book is structured, yeah. it's riffs. Uh -huh. And yeah, it's an ode to jazz and kind of a, a thumb to 70s music, while 70. at the same time it's celebrating it because I bring a lot of that music back into the A lot of great the 70s narrative. music. <laughs> rock the boat. I mean, what was I know, rock the saying? boat. That, that kept going through my yeah. head today as I was preparing. Do you want to yeah. give us a rendition? Or, no. Yeah. Jay? No. You okay. so don't want me to give you a rendition. Yes. Um, but uh, our yeah. Nina Simone's um, Tom Thumbs Blues, which is a beautiful song, um, but the girls couldn't understand what it was saying. And I think that is that thing about adolescence. We think the music is speaking to us and we think we understand what it's saying. And then we realize later on that maybe not so much. Uh, so I, so I, I, I just loved being able to put on my headphones and revisit that music and, um, and just remember it and remember how important it was to me as an adolescent and then look at it from an adult perspective and realize not a whole lot was being said <laughs> in a lot of those songs. <laughs> well, you know, there's that one moment where she, where August sees Jerome, mm -hmm. um, her love, her mm -hmm. teenage love with um, her, one of her best Sylvia. friends. Uh -huh. And there's a, I, I'm, I'm not quoting, you may, may remember the exact line, but it's the world just falls apart as only 15 mm -hmm. year old worlds mm -hmm. can fall apart mm -hmm. that way, right? Yeah, I don't remember the line, but yeah, it, it, it shatters it for her. I mean, it, for her, it's the moment of coming into adulthood. And when I was writing it, one thing I was trying to investigate is how women grow up to not have women friends. Mm -hmm. And I think that for me, you know, as a mom, as a partner, the, my village is what grounds me, the women in mm -hmm. my life and the men are the people who help me raise my children, who ground me, who help me get my books into the world and all these ways in which I need that, those women. And when I would meet women who say, you know, I can't have women friends, um, I don't trust well, them. Well, in August's case, yeah, your main character. The, the mother in the book doesn't. Right. Say it again? That's what I was yeah, going to say. The mother in your book doesn't believe in female. Yeah, yeah. so that, says, that was me. She says, to... don't trust women. Even the ugly ones will take what you thought <laughs> was <laughs> yours. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, that, it is that thing of, um, you know, how do you get from this very intimate place of girlhood friendships to having no female friends? And, and I, I wanted to investigate it because I didn't understand and I always say I write because I have all these questions, you know, not answers. And what is it, what, what breaks us? What causes us to move away from each other in this way that could, you know, be very detrimental to our own humanity? Um, so, so, I don't know, it, it's a big question for me. Every time I meet a woman who's like, nah, I don't have female friends, I'm just like, wow, that's heartbreaking. Well, I, and that. I think it is the way August and her circle start together. August sees these three girls and she just, for some inexplicable reason, she's just drawn to them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, Jay, similarly, I mean, I think um, I was thinking about similarities between your books. It's obvious to me anyway that um, male friendships have been so important to you in your writing life, in your career. I mean, when I don't know whether Russell is drawn directly from you know, someone like Morgan Entrekin or, but you have a very close circle, it seems to me, of male friends who, um, you know, enab perhaps enable you to really do a good job of capturing those, you know, th that sense of bonding. Well, um, I, sh I should mention that Russell Calloway, um, the protagonist uh, of, this, of this novel, is, is an editor <clears throat> and, and actually he, when we meet him in this book, he's the, he's also the publisher of a small independent literary publishing house. And, um, and I actually have a couple of close friends in my life who are, who are editors and publishers and, and, and have, have uh, had for, I guess, more than, more than 30 years now. And yeah, I guess in, in, inevitably I do draw on these uh, people in my life uh, in, in when, it, when I'm shaping my characters, although, although I have to say that um, this, is actually, uh, this is actually the third book in what is now obviously a trilogy, and 
Uh, at this point, I can't really remember, you know, what I took from whom, right. uh, including myself. But mm -hmm. Russell Calloway, to me, seems like a, a sort of a real character out there in the world. And um, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure I owe parts of him to my various friends. Well, and there's a, you know, I think one of the things about the two of you um, together New York, I think, we, we feel as if it is a kind of community, a literary community in some ways. So there is that insularity or that, mm -hmm. you know, that, that community of writers. But then we're writing about two very different um, kinds of um, communities. Um, I just want to switch a little bit to um, influences. Mm -hmm. And um, Jackie, I'll start with you because I know that for you, James Baldwin was mm -hmm. an influence. Um, Virginia Hamilton was very much of an influence. Um, another wonderful young adult writer. Uh -huh. um, and Nikki Giovanni. Yeah. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the influence of those writers on your work and how that feeds what you do? Um, I think one of the biggest parts of the influence was that, of course, they were writing about people I really cared about and, um, and could see reflections of myself inside of. And they were also, I think the thing that I was figuring out was the context of myself in the bigger world. And, um, it, you know, I knew that the writing couldn't just be navel-gazing, <laughs> that I had to look at myself as being here now, or look at my characters as being here now, and the impact they were, gonna ha they were having on the world and the world was having on them. When you look at something like James Baldwin's Another Country, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a huge book that really gets us into the head of talking about race, of talking about economic class, mm -hmm. of talking about sexuality, and all these things that would eventually be very important to me. Um, Nikki Giovanni, the same thing, C listening to her, because I, I heard her before I read her, um, during the whole black power movement was really important to me, not only in figuring out who I was becoming, but in giving me license to write about what I cared about writing on the page. And the same with eventually even Raymond Carver in terms of looking at a writer that was minimalist. Something you guys really share. <laughs> <laughs> but also he was writing about underserved white folks, right. which was my first right. meeting people who were struggling that way. Um, so I think um, those writers definitely gave me license to kind of tell the stories I would right. eventually tell. Jay, your character, Russell, um, loved Raymond Carver. <laughs> Did you share that love? Well, I, um, Raymond Carver was my teacher and my, um, in some ways, my mentor. Although, Where was he your teacher? Uh, I went to, uh, I studied creative writing at Syracuse in the early 80s, and I was very lucky to have uh, not only Carver, but Tobias Wolf uh, as my teachers, too. Uh, very different teachers. Although, Anybody who hasn't read Raymond Carver's yeah. short stories, mm -hmm. when I, one of the best. When I, uh, when I was thinking about going to graduate school in the, in the early 80s, uh, uh, Carver was, was probably the most imitated, most admired and imitated short story writer in the country. And everybody, we were all trying to write stories <laughs> like Carver. And, um, um, you know, we were, we were trying to, you know, imitate his titles. Like, what do you think of this? <laughs> Hun Hun <laughs> and, um, and we were, and you know, for, for someone like me who, who did not grow up, you know, in a trailer park in the, in, in the western states, it was kind of ridiculous, the, the fact that I was trying to write about characters like this. But, you grew up in Hartford, but, right? Uh, no, no, I grew up all over, the, all over the country, but it was, it was always one suburb or another. So it was, it was pretty inauthentic of trying to imitate Carver, and yet... I think that that's one of the ways that writers, uh, you're talking about influence, I think that's one of the ways that writers find their own voices and mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, to borrow Carver's, um, of one of his titles, putting yourself in, in someone else's shoes. And, uh, you know, for, um, in my case, imitating Carver, imitating Hemingway, imitating DeLillo, imitating Ann Beattie, and eventually, eventually, you know, outgrowing those imitations, but it's like trying on your parents' clothes and your sh and shoes. And um, um, uh, Car Carver was 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 extremely influential um, in many ways to me. Um, although I, I although I gave up trying to imitate his subject matter and his titles, and uh, he taught me an awful lot about economy and and and, and concision and storytelling. Uh, my, one of my favorite 
incidents with him was he used to go over my short stories in, 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 in the office after class. And at and, and one point he said to me, he said, why do, you, why do you use the word dirt here? I mean, why do you use the word earth here? What you really mean is dirt. He said, you're, you're, you're mm -hmm. trying for a kind of grand, grandiosity that you don't need. And, um, That's so interesting. And that was always, you know, he was... Um, he, he sort of made me really think very hard about my word choices and, and, and what they meant. And, um, and I, I think for a long time I felt him sort of standing on my shoulder when I, when I sat down to write. And yet you became that was a, a novelist. <laughs> I, you know, I, I did. And in fact, um, I always, I don't know, my first, my, my first love was poetry. And then I read Portrait of the Artist as a young man and I thought, Oh well, prose can be very lyrical and musical as well, and and, and about the same time I read Hemingway's *Sun Also Rises*, and uh, and um, so I really I wanted to be a novelist, and yet it, 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 it's hard to just sit down and write a novel. I think you know, for me, uh, as for many, what do you mean? It's easy, writer. right? <laughs> But you know, for, for me, most fiction writers, I think we start out with short stories, and, and some people stay with them, and some people um, right. choose uh, choose novels. And There's a very few people who do both well. Not right. not, mm -hmm. not too so many, true. but uh, John Updike did, I think. Um, but Carver Carver wanted to write a novel and never never succeeded. Uh, and yet, who would, who would have you know? I don't I don't I don't think it in any way lessens his achievement. So Jackie, you're you're known primarily as a young adult novelist. That's mm -hmm. where you've made most of your, um, your, your mark up until now. Mm -hmm. So how does one, does one sit down and say, I'm going to write a young adult novel? And then why did, how is an, another Brooklyn different from a young adult novel? Um, yeah, I definitely, after, I think after Brown and Girl Dreaming got the, National, National Book, Book Award. Award, I was kind of like, I want to try something else now. I don't want to paint a story night again, right? I want to um, really sit down and just kind of refocus for a little while just to do it. And I knew I wanted to play with time more, which is something you can do when you're writing for adults. When you're writing for young people, you stay within a certain space mm. and time. So maybe a year, maybe a weekend, maybe a school year. Um, and there's not that adult perspective. So with when I'm writing a novel where the adult is the main character, I can go back in time, have them look back on their adolescence, then come back into their adult perspective, and I wanted to do that. I wanted the writing to be more implicit, and my young adult writing can be very implicit, but I, I just wanted to go a little bit deeper um, in, into that, that, that adult gaze. And, and, and in terms of the depth of the narrative, I, don't, I think there are so many young adult novels that really go to a lot of really important um, and implicit places, but I wanted to do it just differently. And I wanted to... Um, you know, throw some sex in there. I don't really put a whole lot of sex in the um, young adult novels. Not like they're not having it. You know, not like it's not happening, but it just doesn't see, it, it happens off the page more in my books. Uh, and that's my own religious upbringing. And, um, but I, I, I definitely wanted to challenge myself to, and it, it's the case for what, you know, when I wrote Brown Girl Dreaming, I wanted to see if I could write a memoir in verse. You know, when I wrote, um, if you come softly, I wanted to rewrite Romeo and Juliet, but um, tell it from the, an interracial perspective. So I, I always try to do something differently when I write, and this was where I felt like after Brown Girl Dreaming was the right place to go. Well, since we're talking a little bit about process, Jay, I was wondering, um, you know, you're, this is the third in, in the trilogy for you. Um, what was your, pro and when you, when you began the trilogy, did you say to yourself, I'm going to write a trilogy? No, um, I, I definitely had no notion that I was writing a trilogy. Um, uh, this, this series started with a book called Brightness Falls, which um, was Wonderful pub book, if you pu have not. Pub published just... in 92, and um, that book started out, I was, I was, I, I'd written two very tightly focused sort of um, uh, Manhattan novels that were very, narrow in terms of time frame and, and point of view. And, 
And I was, I was reading Thackeray. And also page count. Yeah, and page count. And I was, I was reading Thackeray and Balzac, and I wanted, I wanted to write a bigger, more panoramic kind of New York novel. And I was standing on Fifth Avenue one day, and there was, like, right across the street from me, a homeless man with a can of bag, a bag of cans, and, there was, and Ronald Perlman, the corporate raider or billionaire. Um, and I only knew who he was because he'd been on the cover of some magazine recently. And I suddenly thought, hey, I want to write a, a novel that has both of those characters in it. Um, but I needed, you know, the whole sort of scope of New York, in other words. But I, eventually I realized I needed somebody, something in the middle. And I came up with this couple, Russell and Kareem Calloway, who sort of one of those couples everybody kind of looks up to. They got married early. They give cocktail parties. They're, Meeting they're, college. They, yeah, they're kind of cool. And, um, and I... Um, the, the, the first novel was, um, was set in the uh, late 80s, and, um, and uh, I certainly didn't think of it as being a part of a series. If I had, I wouldn't have killed off one of the main characters. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, there, there's part a, of the love triangle. There, there's a sort of Jay McInerney <laughs> character, a successful writer, <laughs> right. writer named Jeff Pierce, who's Russell's best friend. And, 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 and Russell's his editor. And, 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 uh, and Russell is his editor. And, um, um, I, he, he actually succumbs to AIDS, and um, I, think that, I think that if I had realized I was writing a series, I, I, I might not have done that. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was kind of me trying to kill off the bad part of myself, this sort of bad boy 80s writer character. And um, so then um, at, when September 11th uh, um, befell New York, uh, when, when the World Trade Towers collapsed, then, um, uh, f like many fiction writers, I think I at first couldn't imagine how to address this catastrophe. And, and eventually I decided to kind of bring it down to a domestic scale and see how Russell and Corrine mm -hmm. Calloway and their friends would react to this event. And suddenly I went back to them. Um, so does the, now that we're saying it's a trilogy, does that mean you're done with those characters? or? Um, well, it's or fun. Will we have a it's funny, um, quartet? It's funny, both Daily and, and Sunday New York Times reviewers in, sort of asked me to write another, uh, another one in the series, although, although the, the guy in the Sunday Times said that he, he, he had mixed feelings about it because they, they always had a huge catastrophe as their backdrop, and <laughs> he wasn't sure whether he wanted to invite another. Uh, in, in this case, it was the financial crisis of 2008 that, that was the backdrop of the current book. Um, so, Jackie, um, mm -hmm. Jay's talking about how big events, mm -hmm. you know, kind of infuse the characters or help shape plots or characters' mm -hmm. lives. Is that a factor um, when you're putting, creating a character? Uh, not always. I mean, it's as writers, of course, it's an emotional factor, right? So something big happens and the emotion of it goes into the narrative. Like when I wrote Behind You, it, was, it took place. 9-11 um, is not mentioned in it at all, but it's all about loss and grieving and when people die suddenly and what do you do with that emotion? Um, so I think that it's hard for us to kind of separate our emotional lives from the lives of our characters, but not necessarily physically putting that stuff into the narrative. But and, I, and August, your background and Aug, you share some similarities. Um, in Brooklyn. Yeah, Brooklyn, Bushwick, definitely. Bush, uh, South Carolina. Uh, she's from Tennessee. Tennessee. Yeah. Tennessee. But yeah. She's from yeah. Tennessee, but there's a lot, that there are some South. references in South Carolina. There's the, yeah. uh, she, uh, she comes from a, she comes from landed gentry, basically, right? She comes from a family that had a lot of land and then couldn't hold on to it. Um, I didn't come from that. So, <laughs> um, and definitely my, I, my uncle had converted to the Nation of Islam, but we right. were raised Jehovah's Witnesses. But when he, got, when he came home from prison and he was part of the Nation of Islam, then my family, I guess, thinking there wasn't enough religion in the house, we became <laughs> part of the Nation of Islam as well as witnesses. So, um, wow. Um, that is a lot of religion. A lot yeah, of religion. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of religion. Hence the no sex and the young <laughs> right. right. 
<laughs> but, um, but, but, you know, but the great thing about having grown up with um, both um, being both Muslim and Christian was mm -hmm. I, I'm a firm believer, believer of Walt Whitman's argue not concerning God, right? You just don't, well, it, there's no argument there. But, um, I, but having known a lot about the nation of Islam, I decided I wanted to explore it further. So I did end up having to do a lot of, a lot of research mm -hmm. on the religion because there was a lot of stuff I didn't know about it. Um, I'm not a big fan of research, but I also had to go back and research Bushwick because there was, right. I, I knew about the white flight. Um, I knew about the blackout. Um, I knew about free lunch programs and some of that stuff, but there was a lot of stuff I yeah. either did remember. Know, and the music. And the music. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny because in your book, all the white people are fleeing Bushwick, uh -huh. and, and now they're all going back to Bushwick. <laughs> I know, which is how, part how of the reason that? I wrote it, because I think those white people coming to Bushwick don't realize that yeah. it was a neighborhood inhabited by people who right. were thriving right. there. I, th yeah. I think that history, and, and that's why I dedicated to for Bushwick, 1970 to 1990, because I think there is a way in which people for, like to forget history and forget that this was once a neighborhood that their ancestors fled from, you know, and that yeah. here they're coming back and discovering it. Well, we don't have unquote. that much more time before we go to questions, but there's another um, similarity that I think you mm -hmm. both share, and that is that you've both, um, Jay, in your case, you shot to fame when mm -hmm. you were, what, 29 with Bright Lights, Big City. And in your case, Jackie, um, and, you know, and received tons of critical pra praise and prizes and so on. And um, in Jackie's case, you know, winning um, some really wonderful awards, um, the Caldecott, the, Caldecott uh, the Cal Honor. National Book Award, mm -hmm. uh, Coretta Scott King. Um, so you've had, you know, sort of benchmarks in your careers that a lot of writers never get to, mm -hmm. right? So. Let's start with you. What did it mean for you to begin to receive that kind of accolade? It, I always think of the awards, I mean, as something that is for that book, right? Even the Lifetime Achievement Awards, they're for that body of work, but it's not necessarily for anything I'm going forth to do. And I think that's the thing that keeps me writing. I think I am very grateful that I didn't get my first Newbery until about my seventh book. I think, um, and, and that kind of, it definitely helped me keep a perspective on why I was doing the work I was doing. It wasn't, I was grateful for the awards, I liked the medals, I liked putting the stickers on my book, but, um, <laughs> um, but I did, I think I, it, did, it did give me um, this kind of faith to be able to keep doing the work, but, but you know, writers are, Introvert. So one thing that comes with the awards is you have to be is, out, the, out this, yeah. facing a sea of yeah. faces. And Jay, you well, ja Jacqueline has won far more awards than I have and <laughs> prizes. Um, uh, I think most most of mine came from France and Italy, actually. Um, um, I did have a a very large success with my first novel, though, and, and no one could have been more surprised than I was. I was really hoping. I was kind of hoping to get a few good reviews so I could get a teaching job or a newspaper job out of it. And uh, that seemed like the only reasonable expectation at the time. Um, I, I had worked at Random House reading manuscripts for as a, um, you know, a kind of underpaid assistant. And, and I had seen lots of books published with no, no fanfare, no um, acclaim whatsoever. And my, the, the vice president of Random House took me out uh, for lunch shortly before publication, he said, look, you know, nobody, you know, the novel's dying, nobody of your generation reads anymore. <laughs> um, you wrote a nice book, but don't expect much. And that uh, was way before Kindle. And <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, and uh, it turned out that for a variety of reasons, um, the book became extremely successful. And uh, I think the main thing it did was it gave me a career because I, I was able to then go on and write uh, write full time. I didn't end up taking a teaching job or a, uh, a newspaper job, and I'm and I'm really grateful for that. Um, it's uh, um, and I'm and, and I'm and I'm still writing. And you're still <laughs> writing. You're both you're you're both such wonderful writers. Um, Thanks, we have to wind it down a little bit um, so we can begin to take questions. Um, we have ten, ten minutes for questions, or should we keep keep talking up here? Okay. So All right. Back. So. Um, who would like to start with the first question? <laughs> yep, here comes one. 
Um, so I have a question for Jacqueline Woodson. I read your children's books to my students all the time. <coughs> I love The Other Side, Each Kindness. It's just, they're such powerful books. And I was wondering, how is writing a children's book, which is something that I'm trying to do, different than writing um, a young adult book? Mm -hmm. And what you know, pointers do you have for someone like me? Um, well, thanks for sharing them. Uh, writing a picture book is the absolute hardest thing you can write. I when bet, you think yeah. of the attention span you're working with, how you have to get in there immediately and um, take it line by line. And you know, if you lose them by the third line, they're gone. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's important to read a lot of poetry if you're thinking about writing uh, books for the very young. I didn't come to picture books until I had written about eight or not, no, it was actually my 12th young adult middle grade book that, and then I wrote um, a picture book. But I think that that's really hard and the only way you can do it is really reading a lot of poetry and reading a lot of uh, picture books. I find that young adult writing is a little bit easier for me than writing picture books. Can I, can I just ask, sure. I've always been curious about the process between the illustrator and the, uh -huh. And the writer. Um, what is that like? So I get to choose my illustrators, but once I choose them, I'm not allowed to talk to them at all. Wow. Uh, except for Showway, because that was a story of my family, and I use family photographs and stuff. And so basically, it's the illustrator's interpretation of the narrative, and then the two come together to form this other thing. And so with the other side, I got to see sketches and then some paintings, but you really are not supposed to have a dialogue. And with a picture book, mm. the pictures should stand on their own without the words and the words just stand on their own without the picture so when you submit a book to a publisher that story has to stand on its own and the pu publisher has to be able to imagine what the illustrations what, what the book would look like illustrated thank you thanks You're for welcome. the question uh, this is for Jay uh, in addition to your fiction I've always enjoyed your wine writing do you plan mm. on doing any more of that in the future <laughs> um, yeah I have a I have a kind of second career as a um, a wine writer and a wine critic. Uh, it started almost 20 years ago when a friend of mine took over House and Garden magazine and wanted a wine column. And she thought all the, you know, as a reader and consumer, she found most wine writing to be pretty boring. And she asked me if I would be interested. And I protested that I didn't really know enough. And, but she felt that, you know, just to be a passionate amateur who was, had some writing chops might, might be a good place to start. Um, and it's become strange. I, I agreed to do it for six months, and I'm still doing it 20 years later, although I moved, mm. I moved from House and Garden to the, the Wall Street Journal. I'm, I'm still writing um, about wine for um, uh, Town & Country magazine. And uh, I, I have um, I published uh, three collections of essays about wine, yep. for those of you who are interested. And I, I certainly try to write from uh, I, I, from a perspective um, that is not uh, that of a specialist or an expert, and um, I don't know, it, it, it's a great, it's you know, it's it's a great kind of relaxation from writing fiction. I, I find it, I, I, I find it a, a little easier, a lot more fun, and it, and it gets me out of the house. Mm. <laughs> and yeah, I'm going to keep doing it. <laughs> yes, thank you for your great. question. So I'm a Chicago girl, but um, I love Greenpoints in Brooklyn. I love Waynesburg and Queens. And, and those areas of, of New York today are the same as they were 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So when you're writing of areas during, during the past in, in your books, how do you guard against, I'm trying to write history, but how do you guard against writing about nostalgia? So there are two different things. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I write about both. But. Yeah. yeah, it's both. I, I feel like it's both. We're writing about history nostalgically, right? Yeah. <laughs> so so it, is the, it is that balance. They're both in there. Yeah, I mean, my, my, I think my characters, um, I, I, I mean, th 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 this book is already somewhat historical because it's about more or less the financial crisis of 2008. Um, and uh, my, my characters, in turn, are looking back often further um, to the days of their youth. And uh, I think there's very few of us who aren't prone to nostalgia, particularly when we get a little older. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my question is for Ms. Woodson. I am a fourth grade teacher. I teach reading and Virginia history. 
And one of the biggest questions that kind of looms over my students in their touchscreen world is, why are books important? Why is reading important? <laughs> and I'm just wondering what you would say uh, to them. Um, you know, I think it's, it's a good question. I think as the teacher, of course, we know you set the tone in the room, right? That's, that's the power of teaching is you get to decide everything from um, letting the kids choose their own preferred gender pronoun to having big conversations about race and economic classes, all you. Um, and I think in terms of um, um, reading, I mean, I think Jay and I could both answer this. They're, reading is everywhere. Reading is so necessary in every single part of your life, from reading um, the, the um, directions for the Pokemon app <laughs> to, to reading the back of the cereal box to um, you know, reading a really good book or a comic strip. It, 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 words are everywhere, and they're going to be with us for the rest of our lives, even, even if the ways we read change, there, there's always going to be the need for that content. Right, and so so they're gonna need it in their lives. What do you what? what how yeah. do you respond to your students when they ask you that, or when that <laughs> question um, is in the air? I respond by saying that books help us understand ourselves. They help us understand other people, and through that understanding, they make us better people. Yeah, and I think all of us probably share. Jay was talking a little bit earlier about being a, a passionate amateur. Mm -hmm. You know, when um, people ask, like me, for example, um, you know, being a book editor in, in my past or being the books editor for a magazine, you know, is, that, is there some big industry? Yes, there's an industry, but I think we probably all started by just being readers. Mm -hmm. You know, like being in love with reading, addicted to reading, using books as like a shield or a way in, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, you know, it's, it's so miraculous that we're able to inhabit or travel, you know, to someone else's mind or another country just sitting by sitting there, there with something in front of us. Okay. Pretty amazing. Jay, do you have anything to add on that subject? Um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, you know, for, for me, I, I was, um, uh, I, I was a great nomadic kid. My, Dad changed jobs every seven or eight months, it seemed, and um, re reading became, you know, um, my source of companionship and also my my um, window window onto the wider world. Yes. Um, I have a question for Ms. Woodson. How did you start your own book and your own series? How did I start my own book? Um, I I've known I wanted to be a writer since I was seven. And, uh, you know, I, I talk about it in Brown Girl Dreaming. I got in trouble for lying a lot. And I had a teacher who said, write it down. You know, and it was, a, it, it, it was such a strong, I was constantly making up stories. But um, I was also bored a lot. Um, I think that's the difference between my kids and, and who I was as a kid. You know, we had commercials. Television went off at 6 o'clock, and then the news came on. We had three channels. So there were all these places. You know, I was in, the king, I was in houses of worship a lot. So there were a lot of places to be bored. And I, um, <laughs> and I, would, I would make up stories, and I would write. And I just, I just kept doing it. I didn't know that it would eventually be this, but I knew that I needed to do it for my own salvation. When and did I, you start writing it down? Uh, I, when I was seven, when I learned how to write my name, you know, from that point I realized how powerful putting letters together and words together and words making sentences and sentences making paragraphs, like that was mind blowing to me that it was just that simple um, and that, that what was in my head I could actually put on paper and it could be something. Do you want to be a writer? Yes. yes. Right. Stick with it. Hi, um, this is for Jay. Um, I know you're very renowned as a Manhattan writer, but I have to take issue with you, the first thing you said uh -oh. of your description of Manhattan in the 80s. I lived in Manhattan all through, uh, you know, for about 40 years. And I raised a child in the 80s on the Upper West Side, and your description is totally unrecognizable to me. Mm -hmm. There were no crack files I was stepping over. There, were, I mean, well, a gross generalization of 
what was the problem in New York? Like, well, there was, there were these pockets. Of, yes, of, of course. There were these pockets of civilization. The <laughs> Upper West Side and the Upper East Side were, um, you know, these long established residential areas where, where families were raised. But around the edges, of there course, was, I wouldn't disagree and, with and that. for that matter, Am Amsterdam <laughs> Avenue and Needle Park in the, on the Upper West Side, where when when I arrived when I arrived in New York in the early '80s, it was like Amsterdam Avenue was almost uncrossable. Yeah. It was it was pretty I dangerous. It every day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your input. <laughs> oh, we have one little girl. That, la this is our last, last question. question. Yeah. Last question. Sorry. Can I make this shorter? You could just <laughs> bend it bend it down towards you. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, What's your name? From, my name is Margaret. Hi, Margaret. And this is from Mrs. Woodson. Um, what's your favorite Margaret. medium, like, when you're writing? Um, thanks for your question, Margaret. And I love that you adjusted the mic first. <laughs> um, I, I usually start writing by hand, and when the ideas start coming fast, I move to the computer and then I go back to writing by hand. So I go back and forth. Um, just because I always have a pad and a pen somewhere, and I write on my hand sometimes. But wherever, <laughs> wherever I, I don't have any today, today is, today is a bust. <laughs> so, but yeah, I have a ton of pens right now. Um, so yeah, by hand and then by, I have a laptop that I carry everywhere. Um, Viking will be able to tell you that. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.